It's great to be here. I am an East Anglian. I was born in Cambridge and now spend my time half, half the time in Cambridge and half the time in, in Norwich. Um, and I really should come to Bury more often, I know, uh, for lots of, lots of good reasons. Um, the title for this talk is Surveillance and Privacy in a Changing World. And the emphasis really is on the changing. I think that's, that's something that we, we need to understand. And um, as Julian said, things are changing all the time. There's a new development. Literally every day I find something that I should be thinking about or writing about in relation to this field. And, and this morning, for those of you who were listening on, on the radio, we've had a discussion about safety for children online. It's been, there's been a government announcement that they're going to make the UK the safest place for children to be online. And I listened to the discussion about it this morning with trepidation. Not trepidation because I was afraid of what's going to happen to the children. I have an 11-year-old daughter, so I, these issues are, are very much in my field. But trepidation for what remarkably stupid thing the government was going to come up with this time. Because one of the things that, 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 that we have to deal with when we're thinking about surveillance, privacy, and the changing world is how little our governments understand what's actually going on and why mostly what they do is either ineffective or more likely actually counterproductive. And this is where my subtitle comes in. Do we have to balance freedom and safety? Because what I'm going to try to tell you is that it's not really a balance. The balance they always talk about, should we give up some freedom in order to be more safe and secure, is largely a false one. Actually, if we do things right, we get freedom and safety. And if we get things wrong, we get neither freedom nor safety. And in general, our government's approach gives us neither freedom nor safety. But that's... I, would, I should say that's not a political point, even though I politically disagree with this particular government enormously. Um, it was equally true under the, late, the last Labour government that they got policy over the internet and so on pretty much completely wrong in, in, in every way. Um, so I'm not making a, a specific political point, I'm making a more general point. And the general point is actually about this idea of a changing world. And governments have a great deal of difficulty dealing with change. And we see that in so many different ways at the moment. And the point about the internet in particular is that the change is continuous, the change is fast, and the change is sometimes disconcerting. What we have to learn is how to deal with what is fairly continuous change, which is difficult to deal with. I mean, I, I teach in a law school. The law is incredibly slow at dealing with almost everything. How the law deals with this changing world is very, very difficult. So the questions we're going to ask, some of the issues we need to deal with. First of all, how we use the internet. Now, when I first started talking about this, this subject, I first started working on the internet in the early, early 90s, if I came to a room like this, I'd say, who knows what the internet uh, is about? And I'd have maybe two or three hands poking up. Now, if I say, who uses the internet, it would be extremely unusual to find a single person who doesn't use the internet and who doesn't use the internet a lot. And actually, almost everybody uses the internet more than they realize they use the internet. They're doing stuff that uses the internet when they don't realize they're doing stuff that uses, uses the internet. And they use the internet for every single aspect of their life without realizing it. How did this lecture get public publicized? Mostly on the internet. How do we organize our social lives? Mostly on the internet. How do we shop? On the internet. Some people don't. <laughs> but there are a few people who don't use it for these things at least a little bit. And how businesses organize themselves is on the internet. How you find out whether a shop in the real world is going to be open or not, you check the opening hours on the internet. 
If you don't, you're unusual, and I'm rather proud. That you should be rather proud of yourself if you're if you're not. I saw it in the paper. You sort of, well, even better. But actually, most papers get more contact, more information from their websites than they do from their printed versions. And almost all things that have a real-world existence also have an online existence. So that means we have to think about that. We also have to think about um, what bits of this should be concerning us. And this is where I was interested in the discussions this morning about um, child safety on the internet. The th it was a very interesting phone-in on the radio. To begin with, we had the kids talking, and then we had the adults talking. The kids knew what they were, what they were talking about. The adults pretty much exclusively didn't. They were guessing what the children should be worried about, and they were wrong. And, and of course it's normal. It, it's normal, in, 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 and that's part of what we need to understand about the internet. It is not something separate and different from everything else. It is in so many ways just an extension of, of normal life, and actually the patterns that we see are extensions of what we do in normal life. What we should be worried about are actually mostly the things that we should have been worried about beforehand, just in a slightly different manifestation. What we shouldn't be worried about is also the same. That is, we shouldn't be worried about the things that we shouldn't have been worried about before when we were, when we were um, growing up. And, and it's really great. I've just met one of my teachers from secondary school again, and I was thinking what, I, what they were worried about for us. Same stuff, actually, in most, in most ways when I, was, when I was that age, just in a different place. Bullying and cyberbullying directly connected. Very directly connected. Similar stuff all the way through. Related to that, what do we need protecting from? And we come across the same stuff again, that, that if you look at things like sexual abuse, we all worry about stranger danger. Actually, it's much more likely to be closer to home than that. And most of the stuff that we worry about online, actually, we should be much more worried about the stuff that's close to home. This is the big question for people like me. Should security win over privacy? And we'll talk quite a, quite a lot about that. <laughs> Should, for example, the authorities be able to look at everything and, and everything we do all the time to protect us from terrorists? I, as I will try to explain, the answer is probably not. And finally, this is a question that will run throughout the thing. What is privacy anyway? Because Actually, we talk about it a lot without pinning it down. And as I will explain, as a privacy scholar, the trying to pin it down is actually one of the problems. It is really hard to define what privacy is. But actually, it's relatively easy to feel when something is invading your privacy. Sometimes it is, a, it is more this feeling, is, is something creepy or not, is actually a better judge of whether it's invading your privacy than does it fulfill some precise definition that some scholar has put in some book or some lawmaker has put into some law. It's sometimes hard to understand what privacy is when it's not in your field and not in your area. And we had a particularly interesting case of this a few years ago when the Samaritans um, were trying to launch a system to detect whether people were in a vulnerable position. And they couldn't understand why it is that actually vulnerable people with mental health problems were concerned that people, other people were able to judge what their mental health state was like by analysing what they were doing on Twitter. Because from their perspective, this was stuff they'd put in public. We should be able to analyse and do whatever we want to to that. But from their perspective, they were putting out some intimate stuff that they didn't want to be judged on. And they're different perspectives and different attitudes. And we get to the question of who deserves privacy, who should have privacy, who has a right 
to privacy. And I, I'll just mention briefly again the children, the, the, the perspective of children. Who do you think children need privacy from more than anybody else? Their parents. And yet who do we think should be allowed to invade their privacy at all times? Their parents. It's all about power in a way. The people that you need privacy from are the people who have power over you. And for children, that's parents. For employees, it could be their employers. And we have a big issue right now about employer surveillance. Employers watching what their employees are doing and trying to judge them. Actually doing things like finding out who's going to be a troublemaker. They watching whether they're joining unions and things like that. Now is that right? It really is not because it takes a power relationship and lets more powerful people have more power over the, over the relatively weak. And this question of whether we have privacy in public is a big question, which, which I'll talk about more, because when you're on the internet, what is public and what is private is much more complicated to judge. But we have this question in the real world as well. Am, are, we, are we in public here now? Yes? OK. Are we in public if we're in a shopping mall? Well, you may not, might be surprised to know you're probably not. The shopping malls are generally owned by companies. They are private places that, that's why they can have security guards in those places and CCTV that's under control of them. Does that count as public? And on the internet, it's much more complicated. If you're on Facebook, is that a public place? These are not questions that have easy answers. And that's true not only in terms of the law, but in terms of what we feel. Surveillance is another matter. And surveillance is where we get a little bit complicated. We have an instinctive fear of surveillance in one particular way. As you can see, if you watch any kind of dystopian future film or read any kind of, uh, kind of fiction, there is an idea that surveillance is a bad thing. Big Brother is watching you. And I actually do a talk um, where I use... The films of, of Disney, the Disney princesses, as a way of illustrating how um, privacy works. Every single villain in every single Disney princess film uses surveillance. It may not, it may not be particularly obvious, but they do. The queen in Snow White looks in the magic mirror to find where Snow White is. Surveillance. We have an instinctive idea that surveillance is something to worry about. And there's a good reason for that. But when we look at Big Brother the State in, in 1984, in, in Orwell, we actually miss how our society has developed these days. Because actually, Big Brother has a whole load of corporate partners who are doing most of the watching for him. Well, our question is, does it matter if they're watching us? The government would tell you not. And the extent to which we accept CCTV cameras in almost every public place suggests that we don't worry so much about it. And do we have to let Big Brother watch us? Is it something that's absolutely necessary? And this is a question we ask all the time. And this question again about, about balance. But let me just give you a little definition here. I tried not to define um, privacy. I deliberately avoided it. I am going to try and define surveillance. David Lyons is one of the biggest, the most famous surveillance scholars. He defined it as the focus, systematic, and routine attention to personal details for purposes of influence, management, protection, or direction. Now, some key words in there. Notice that we're talking about Influence, management, protection, and direction. We're not just talking about safety. And if you look at how surveillance works in practice, it's often doing several of these things at once. But influence is one of the biggest ones. Surveillance is often a, intended to alter behavior, to influence you to do something you wouldn't otherwise do, 
or to not do something that you were planning to do, to influence how you, how you behave. And one of the most famous surveillance ideas is this, the idea of the panopticon, which was developed originally by Jeremy Bentham for use in prisons. The idea was that it would be a prison where the guard post was right in the middle and could look out onto all the prisoners' cells. And the idea of this was, if you think you're, you might be watched at any time, you won't behave badly. Maybe it's true. Actually, it didn't seem to work very well in prisons. The idea of it was to control people who you instinctively think are going to do bad things. So when you think of our society bringing in surveillance, it is treating us as people who are essentially about to do something bad, and we've got to stop them doing bad. Again, it's, a, it's an attitude to people that we need to, we need to think about. Is that suitable for a democratic, free society? <coughs> And is it suitable for the internet? Because, as I said, we live our lives on the internet. And that means that internet surveillance is watching everything we do. It's watching our entire lives. And, it, and specifically, it is not like the old-style surveillance of tapping your phones, or even like CCTV, because even though you're all happy to have, or I assume many of you are happy to have CCTV in shopping centres and on the streets, I don't think there's likely to be many of you who have CCTV in your living room or your bedroom or even the toilet. And in effect, the sort of internet surveillance that we have actually does all of that. It does that in a way that we don't, we don't expect. And it means, because of that, we need to think a bit more clearly. Now, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to, going to give you a few examples of things where we don't think clearly about surveillance. Some of these are a little bit technical, but I'll see if I can explain why they matter. These are, these are what I call seven myths of surveillance. And I have to say, this is a preview of some of the stuff that's coming into the book I'm currently writing. The first myth is that there's a balance to be kept. The second is that privacy is an individual right, rather than something that actually underpins how we function as a society. The third, and now we're getting a little bit technical, is that content can be separated from metadata. Now, for those of you who are IT people, and I know there are at least one or two IT people here, you'll understand what I mean, but what we're talking about here is whether what you put in an email matters or all the stuff surrounding what you put in the email. I will explain more. Because related to that is the, is, is the fourth myth, which is that content is what really matters. And I'll explain again why that matters. The second, the next one, is that government surveillance matters more than corporate surveillance. Again, we should be worried about Big Brother, but we don't need to worry so much about the corporate partners, the Facebooks and so on. And Related to that, that we can actually consider the two as separate issues. Now, one of the examples here, uh, just before Edward Snowden released all the information revealing the spying levels of um, the NSA, um, President Obama launched something which he called the Consumer's Rights to Privacy Online. He was making a great declaration. We need privacy online. We support it as a government which was blown out of the water the year later when it turned out his government was watching everything that everybody did in, in every way. But the point was he described them as consumers. He only treated them as people who were consuming something, not as citizens or even human beings. And he was saying, from his point of view, we can separate them. What the, 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 the Facebooks of this world do is totally separate from what the NSA does. It's not true. And then the final one, that more surveillance means more security. And I hope I'm going to be able to show that, that none of these are true. Right. So let's look at this first myth, this idea of a balance. So here's a little quote from Sir Malcolm Rifkind, who at the time was the chair of the Intelligence and Security Committee. He said, there is a balance to be found between our individual right to privacy and our collective right to security. And um, this was 
again, rather interesting. It was fairly soon, fairly, fairly shortly before he lost his post as chair of the um, Intelligence and Security Committee after being caught out by a, uh, a film crew um, with a sting showing that he was willing to sell his, uh, his influence to um, Chinese investors. Caught out by surveillance, as it turns out, uh, hidden, hidden cameras. Um, it isn't really a, a, a balance, but it's a, the, the suggestion of a balance is one of the most strongly put things by members of the security services. They don't see that actually, if you have more surveillance on people, it has an effect that can actually reduce our security. I'll get back to that with the, with the, the, the last the last myth. But the, the myth of this balance is a very, very, very powerful one. And it's taken further by the second myth from the same quote that our right to privacy is an individual one. And let me take these two together. When I first describe what privacy is, I said two things. I said privacy for who and privacy from whom. Now that shows you one, one of the things. It's a relationship issue that privacy is about. Privacy, to some degree, is about what information you want to communicate to whom. You will tell different things to your mother that you tell to your boyfriend. You'll tell, tell different things to your boss than you will to your mate down the pub. And you'll tell stuff to your mate down the pub that you certainly don't want your boss to know, or potentially your partner or your children or anything like that. You will want to have some influence over, over that. And that means that privacy is very much about relationships rather than just about your individual stuff. It's also true that privacy is absolutely crucial for communities to function. And we've had a really interesting illustration of that in the, the last few days with the uh, Conservative Party um, WhatsApp groups. I don't know if people have been following this news, but it turns out that Conservative MPs have little groups in which they discuss particular things about which particular cabinet mem member they want to have sacked and who they want to replace <laughs> Theresa May and, 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 and all this kind of stuff. And they do it in little groups. And those groups could not function without having privacy within their individual groups. And in fact, one of them complained that others were leaking out information from their group, so breaching their privacy, which meant they couldn't talk frankly about which member of their cabinet they wanted to sack, and, and so on. But it shows you, if you actually want to function as a group, your group needs privacy from the outside world or from other groups. Privacy works very importantly as part of what makes groups work. It's not just an individual right. Moreover, having privacy increases your security. If you want to communicate something securely with your lawyer, with your doctor, having that privacy allows you to do that. And you can't keep your security if you don't have your privacy. Which means the first myth, that there's a balance to be kept, is missing the function of privacy itself. Next myth, that you can separate metadata. Now I just want to bring attention to a couple of quotes here. The first quote is from Obama. This was immediately after the Snowden leaks. Nobody is listening to your phone calls. And this is... Uh, former GCHQ director, um, Sir David Ormond. Nobody is reading all your emails. They said this thing again and again and again and again. And they continue to say it even now, even though they know that the people who understand this know that these things are not true. Particularly when you're looking at internet surveillance, they think that somehow the sites you visit doesn't tell you anything about the content of the sites you visit. If you go to a site, if you, if you visit the Samaritans website, it doesn't mean that you have, it, it doesn't tell you that you're visiting a site that tells you something about um, suicide prevention. If you visit a site about sexuality, they don't need to actually know to read the content of it. They just need to look at the URL. What's the website you're visiting? 
These days we can't separate out the two so easily. And it brings on to the next myth that content matters more. Now, the point here was why were they saying nobody's listening to your phone calls, nobody's reading your emails? Because they thought that's what people would be bothered by. And it makes it seem like they're not intruding on you nearly so much if they're not reading your emails or listening to your phone calls. And then we had, from the Intelligence and Security Committee, no longer for, uh, headed by Sir Malcolm Rifkind at this point, we were surprised to discover that the primary value to GCHU of bulk interception was not in reading the actual content of the communications, but in the information associated with these, those communications. So, GCHQ were more interested in the metadata than the content. Why? Because actually they could get more information from the metadata than the content. Several reasons for that. When you say something in an email, if you are planning some bad thing, you won't say it straight out. You might lie, you might use a uh, a cipher. I don't mean in encrypting the contents, but you might use a code word meaning something else. You might have all kinds of different ways of disguising what you say. It's much harder to disguise the metadata than it is to disguise the content. And that makes a big deal. The other reason is because metadata is in a structured form that can be analysed by computers very easily. Content, frankly, often isn't. So you can do the kind of bulk big data analysis on metadata that you really can't do on content, which makes it much more valuable to the spies. And yet, we still have in law and in the Investigatory Powers Act 2016, known by many people as the Snoopers Charter, it requires much more, you get, need much more permission to look at content than you do to look at metadata. Why? Partly because they knew they could get away with it, because they knew people were still believing that content mattered more than metadata, even though the real experts tell them the opposite. Next one. Why do we care more about GCHQ and the NSA when we give away all our most intimate personal details to Facebook and Google? Now, I was actually asked this question by a representative of the Home Office at a, at a, at a conference. He said, why do people, pe people shouldn't be worried about our surveillance, they already give everything they want to, to, um, to Facebook and Google. And it follows a, a classical argument about privacy. Nobody cares about privacy anymore. Look, we've got two billion people around the world on Facebook. Why would they be on Facebook if they care about privacy? How many people here are on Facebook? Uh, yeah, this is a good crowd. That's the, the, the smallest number I've seen yet, which I approve of thoroughly. I'm not on Facebook. Um, for, for a great many reasons, I'm not on, not on Facebook. But the reality is that the, 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 the two are intimately connected. And that's... I just want to show you... One, one, one other reason you should care about Facebook and corporate people, is that they do stuff to you. Now, I don't know if you can read this, this slide. This is from um, a few years ago, 2014. Mac and Android users charged more on shopping sites than iPhone and Windows users. Why is this? Well, partly it's because they can. If they, they can, first of all, they can detect what you're using to access a shopping site. Secondly, they can tailor the price. You don't see what anyone else is, is being offered for a price. You just see your price. It's not like walking into a shop where you can see the price tag on a product. You just see the price they offer you. And they have worked out that Mac and Android users will pay more than iPhone and Windows users. How have they worked it out? By psychologically analysing you guys, knowing who it is? No. Just by doing big data analysis. They just know how many people have visited and how many people have done this, and they can work it out, and they can automatically charge you more. Now, they can get all kinds of information about you. This is from a big study done, by, done at Cambridge <coughs> University um, on Facebook likes. 
And they found correlations between whether people liked curly fries and their intelligence. I didn't put on here that if you have liked motorbikes, it shows that you are less intelligent. <laughs> Any motorbike riders here? Anyone who's going to admit it now? Um, I have to say, however, this is like in quotes. This is having clicked the Facebook like button. And for those of you who are on Facebook, the one recommendation I would make more than anything else is never click the like button ever. <laughs> Amongst other things, it gives whoever you like permission to access all, all kinds of personal data about you. And I, I, I assume you didn't realise that because they certainly don't make it um, publicly known. And then here's another one. This is much harder to see. I'm afraid I couldn't get a good, good headline on this one. This is evident, experimental evidence of massive st scale emotional contagion through social networks. What does that mean? It means that Facebook can make you happier or sadder if they want to. And they did this experiment with 700,000 people messing around with their news feeds. Some of them they promoted happy stories, some of them they promote that and they relegated sad stories, some of them they did the opposite, and a third group they relegated all emotional content, whether it was happy or sad, to get only the neutral content. The ones who were promote, had the hot, happy stuff promoted got happier. The ones who got, had the sad stuff promoted got sadder. And the ones who got both of them demoted were less engaged on Facebook. They spent less time and did fewer things on Facebook. Now, as far as Facebook's concerned, that's great information. It means they should relegate any emotionless content and get you either happy or very sad, and then you spend more time on Facebook, which is one of the reasons we think that there's more extremism on places like Facebook. They want you to have an extreme reaction. It makes you more likely to spend more time on, on social media. Um, but what it means is, all of this means, corporate surveillance can actually change your life. It can change the prices you pay for the things. It can actually affect your emotional state. It can do all kinds of things. And because all of this is dependent on them doing surveillance, they can't do this without finding out the information about you in order to do it. And here's another one. This is from Australia. Oh, sorry, I lost that one. Facebook told advertisers it can identify teens feeling insecure and worthless. By doing this judgment, they could actually work out your emotional state. And they actually told advertisers, look, here, you can get a, an, an insecure teen here ready for you to sell stuff to. This was from Australia. When Facebook was told, when, this was from a leaked document, a leaked internal Facebook document, when, when this was revealed, they said, um, oh, we're not going to do that. It was only an idea. We never really planned to do it. The other thing to know about Facebook is never take anything Facebook says at face value. Never. And then, going on here, myth six. This is a quote from Bruce Schneier, who's one of the world's leading cryptographers. He said, the NSA didn't wake up and say, let's just spy on everybody. They looked up and said, wow, corporations are spying on everybody. Let's get ourselves a cut. <laughs> now, this is the crucial factor. For people who think corporate surveillance doesn't matter, but government surveillance does, remember that everything that the corporates get, the governments can get access to too. So you get double the spying from the corporates, what the, co what the government does on its own is built on what the corporates do. You can't separate the two. Final myth, maybe the most important, the myth that more surveillance means more security. Here's David Davis, M MP, before he um, went a little mad over Brexit. <laughs> there are genuine concerns that the collect-it-all approach actually makes things worse. This is the haystack argument. If you want to find a needle, why do you build a bigger and bigger haystack? And one of the arguments to make this clear is that every single major terrorist event in Western Europe over the last, I think, seven years, that's all the data I've got, they've already known either one of the perpetrators or all of the perpetrators. They haven't needed to do mass surveillance to find the people who've done the terrorism. They have to watch the individuals that they know about already better. Targeted surveillance rather than mass surveillance works better. And getting more surveillance doesn't help the security. 
I'm paraphrasing Amber Rudd here. Um, Real people don't need end-to-end -end encryption. She should tell her own MPs that because they're all using WhatsApp, which has end-to-end -end encryption, and it's the end-to-end -end encryption that's one of the things that attracts the MPs to, to WhatsApp. This is an argument regularly made that actually ordinary people don't need privacy or security, and actually to get more security we need more. But it's completely false. If real people don't have end-to-end -end encryption, it makes it easier for cyber criminals to perform all kinds of bad things to them. It makes identity theft easier. It makes scamming easier. It makes data breaches, when they happen, and they happen a lot, more damaging. Because if the data that's breached is not encrypted, then it can be used in ways to harm you much more often. Amber Rudd could not be more wrong, really, on this, because it's the real people who do need the end-to-end -end encryption, because the bad guys can put their own encryption on themselves. If we remove encryption, as Amber Rudd would like, we actually help the bad guys, because then they're the only ones who can be secure. It's entirely wrong that more surveillance means more security. Generally very much the opposite. So, what do we do? Well, I think one of the most important things is to keep following developments. And we said things happen every day. And we've got new things coming along. I'll just go through a few of them. We have facial recognition. Now, those of you who are looking to buy the newest iPhone, the one that's not quite out yet, the iPhone X, it's replaced thumbprint recognition with 3D facial recognition. You just look at your phone and it, it unlocks. Facial recognition is becoming a big, big thing. It is something we need to be distinctly concerned about. And for those of you who have children or grandchildren, and you're happy to put your children and grandchildren's photos up on social media, when you do that, you're actually adding them to a massive facial recognition database, which then can be used against them. The Internet of Things. That means things that are connected to the internet, really. It's the, it's the buzzword. It means a smart fridge that tells you when you need more milk and then potentially orders it from, from an online shop to get it delivered to you. It means a smart kettle that you can control with an app on your phone to make it boil as you're walking down the street so it's ready for your cup of tea the moment you get in. Now, you may think these things are absurd, but people have them. And smart kettles were actually used as a route into a major hack for uh, quite a lot of, with, which did quite a lot of, lot of damage. One of the biggest, what we call a denial service of service attack that took down large parts of the internet was done through a particularly insecure web, web controlled camera that could be, um, you could operate from, from a distance and so could the hackers. I can write a lot about fake news. I can tell you a lot about fake news. Most of what you hear about fake news is fake. Um, but that's, that's another story. We have to be very careful about these. There are some reasons, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that fake news is believed more by people than real news. And it's believed by, more by real people uh, than real news for lots of good reasons. We know why. We know because it fits in with their confirmation bias. It matches what their expectations. When you create a fake news story, you can fill, all, fill in all the holes in the plot. It sounds more convincing than real news, which is a bit messy. Troll bots, you probably heard about, uh, you may have heard a little bit about this. Basically, the idea is the Russians have got millions of, of fake identities on Twitter pretending to be nice, ordinary people who are telling you all kinds of stuff. And there were a lot of these in, in concern with the Brexit um, referendum campaign, amongst, amongst other things. Political ma manipulation, again, follow the story about Donald Trump and Facebook and the Facebook ads. It's real. It's not, a, it's not a, a, a conspiracy theory. It happened. Whether it happened enough to make a difference in the election is still not clear, but it did happen and is continuing to happen. And all of it fits together. Now, I'm just going to finish with a couple of things just from the last week. I just thought, just to show you how things move fast. This is from October the 4th, a week ago. 
Google just announced a smart camera that takes photos for you. It doesn't, it doesn't just take photos when you tell it to. It works out with artificial intelligence when you might want a photo taken and then takes it for you. <laughs> Can you see the slight risks in this <laughs> kind of a thing? Okay, and then the next one is from Australia. Federal and state police will be given real-time access to passport, visa, citizenship and driver's license images for a wide range of criminal investigations, not just identifying terrorist suspects, following agreement between federal, state and territory leaders. And then you see the one at the bottom. It doesn't involve surveillance or indeed mass surveillance, the Prime Minister said. Now, he largely does that by using a very interesting definition of, of surveillance. Because the data is already there, it somehow doesn't count as surveillance. Because somebody else gathered the data. Or because you volunteered the data when you voluntarily applied for a driver's license or for a passport or made a citizenship application. This is where things are going much more of it is happening and much more of it will happen. I just want to say how we should deal with it. We should try to stop thinking in, in old terms and using bad analogies. The, the Home Office regularly called this thing called an internet co connection record like an itemised phone bill for the internet. It just isn't because we don't use the internet the way we used phones and the internet doesn't work the way phones do. Know that you don't know. Now that's a, a, a slightly strange thing to say and I sound a little bit like Donald Rumsfeld when I, when I <laughs> say so. Donald Rumsfeld, it's, it's actually the one bit of wisdom that Donald, Donald Rumsfeld ever, ever produced. He talked about the things we know, things we don't know, and uh, things that we know that we don't know and things that we don't know that we don't know. The unknown unknowns. And what we need to be aware of is that these exist, that there's a lot that we don't know. And that if we start trying to make legislation and technology without really realising our own ignorance, we get into a big mess. Amber Rudd, again, I'm sorry I keep mentioning her, Amber Rudd said, it doesn't matter that I don't understand encryption, um, I can still legislate on it, on it without understanding encryption. And in one way she's right, but what she doesn't understand is how much she doesn't understand encryption. She doesn't just not understand encryption, she doesn't even understand what she should understand about in, encryption. And she's not willing to ask the right people to help her. And that's what we need to do. We need to be more willing to ask the right people. Who should you ask about children's safety online? The children. Don't ask the, the people trying to sell you surveillance technology on kids. Don't ask the parents who think they're perfect parents. Actually start talking to the kids. And I would say here, there really are experts on this around. On almost all these subjects, there are people who know a great deal. If you're wanting to know about encryption, talk to the people who know about encryption. The problem is, for people like Amber Rudd, again, when she talks to the people who know about encryption, they tell her the answer she doesn't want to know, doesn't want to hear. They tell her... It's a bad idea to try to ban end-to-end -end encryption. She doesn't want to hear that, so she doesn't listen to the right people. <laughs> I'm just going to leave that one up there. And this is the hardest one. To be willing to change what you do. Now, I'm going to use Facebook as my example here. I've been trying to tell people to leave Facebook since about 2011. Since then, Facebook's usage has gone up massively and almost everyone who I talk to says, well, OK, you, you say don't use it, but I've got to use it. I've got my family in, in another country. I've got my friends. This is the only way we organise our, our lives. And I understand that, but actually there comes a point where we have to be willing to try to do things differently. When we see that things are actually damaging us, we need to be able to to start to change them. The problem is we don't actually realise quite how bad it is yet. And I will, be, I'm, I will be going back and showing people what I was writing in 2011 um, when they realise how bad this was. And I'll try not to say I told you so too loudly. 
Um, and doing that, taking that action means a number of things. Now, we as people have to start putting proper, proper oversight on surveillance. We're doing that a little bit more. Watching the watchers is something that has to happen. We need to consider regulation of social media. Now, this is where I got... I said I was listening with trepidation to the announcements this morning. I think we're thinking of the wrong kind of regulation of social media in the wrong ways for the wrong, with, with the wrong results. We'll, we'll see how it is, um, see what they do. They're trying to regulate against the problems that are not really the big problems. They're not going to be regulating on, for example, targeted advertising on social media, which is what the campaigns used to deal with, to, to do the political manipulation. We're not going to be regulating on the gathering of data by, by um, social media, which is again what allows these things to be targeted in the way they are. Instead, we're going to worry about the cyber bullies and the, and the hate speech and so on, which actually, the reason it works so well is because of the targeting and the, the, and the privacy invasion. We don't go as far, far enough. We need to think about it. We need to stop embracing new technology without thinking. That's really hard. Stuff is nice and shiny and it does cool stuff and we invented we like there's a there's a something that Amazon produced where they can you can dress yourself up before a camera and it will help you with your fashion sense. It will recommend things to buy from Amazon's um, shopping sources that are suitable for your type. Okay, fine, you've got your own personal fashion advisor and it's very cheap, but actually what they're doing is creating an immensely detailed profile of you in order to target advertising at you. And this immensely detailed profile of you can be used in all kinds of horrible ways. And they'll be selling it to all kinds of people and it can be linked, leaked incredibly easily. And from that we get the idea we've got to be more Savvy. We've got to be a little bit more, a bit smarter about how we do things. Now that's something that we all have to try to do. And I'm, I'm relatively optimistic in the sense that when I see the kids, they're much more savvy than their parents. Whether they'll still be savvy when their parents and the technology has moved so much further that there are different issues to deal with, I don't know. And most importantly, we should be talking about this more. We should actually be making our MPs care about it as, as electoral issues rather than um, caring about the wrong things. This has been something I've been trying to do for a long time and failing rather dismally. Anyway, that's it from me and I think we have a few minutes for some questions. I'm sorry I overran a little bit. Uh, it's, a, it's a very um, complex area and I, I think this is one of the reasons that I talk about privacy is important, I talk about encryption is important because actually what we need most of all is to make the entire system more secure and more private and encourage it, not just not discouraging encryption but encouraging much more of it, not just, we need to do something to make these things less likely to happen and actually mostly what we're doing is making them more likely to happen. But it's a problem that, there's, that it's very, very hard to see a solution to. Now, the insurance market is a particularly interesting one for me because the insurance market is also one of the biggest invaders of privacy in, uh, in the world. And one of the, one of the, the things that, that, that bothers me at the moment is the increasing in attempt to get everyone to put a black box in their car to monitor their driving in order to lower their insurance premiums. Very useful in some ways, but has two very bad disadvantages. One is that it 
creates a potential surveillance system which other people can hack into and use. But the other is that it segments the insurance market so much that you, you know exactly what risks are, and that actually destroys the business model of insurance because insurance is about shared risk. It's not about um, tailoring individual, individual risks. I think insurance has to think about a new model because you shouldn't be held effectively responsible for the infrastructural problems created by an environment where there isn't sufficient security and, 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 and privacy. And I would like to see the insurance industry lobbying positively in that way, telling people like Amber Rudd, for God's sake, stop telling people encryption is wrong. And actually tailoring your contracts to, do, to, to require people to be more secure and so on but in, in, in detail. Now, if the corporates are the ones taking out the insurance, that should be perfectly reasonable because you'll be do, doing bespoke deals with them anyway. So requiring them to be properly secure is probably the only way, uh, the only way to do it. But we have such an increasing problem with some of these kinds of crimes and with data breaches particularly that I think it's, it's something that there aren't any easy, easy solutions for. It's not. And I, I, can't, I can't give you a positive answer to your question, but I can say what we're doing mostly as a, as, as a country is actually going to make your problem worse. Yeah, th thank you for your response. And uh, the last thing I would say is you've, you've made me uh, think about my Facebook. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, your views are very clear on how you feel about it. Yeah, I'm, I, yes, I don't have much doubt about that one. <laughs> I think we're like first generation that's grown up where it's kind of been the norm to have it and, yeah. and, and it is so useful like I have friends all over yeah. the UK there kind of is and, and, and uh, uh, in my early days of blogging my most successful blog ever was um, 10 reasons to leave Facebook now um, and the, the follow up to that was what you can do if you can't leave Facebook and top of the list was never click the like button ever um, but there are, there are a whole load of things. There is a happy medium, but I think what's more important than reaching that happy medium is understanding the implications of what, of what things like Facebook. Facebook is a special case because it's so much bigger than all those. And the fact that they own Instagram and own um, WhatsApp as well doesn't, doesn't really help. Um, it's it's that, that the amount of power they have is extreme. And even though you haven't put your information there, they may have got that information from somewhere else. I don't have a Facebook account, but Facebook know who I am because my sister has a Facebook account and she occasionally mentions me and she will occasionally put photographs up that have me in them and they will automatically create what we refer to as a phantom profile of me. And they fill in the gaps of your profile with information they get from, from other directions. So it's not, you being savvy is a help, but while everyone else isn't savvy, it's not that much of a help. Do you see what I mean? And I, my personal view is that until Facebook changes radically, then I think minimising is the first is the best idea. But actually, if you can leave, leave. But I know, particularly for your generation, most of the social activities and many of the other activities are organised through Facebook. There's very little other way. What about organisational Facebook accounts then? Do you like the University of Suffolk Facebook? <laughs> yes, I, I, I um, have an interesting relationship with the University of East Anglia's Facebook activities. They, they, the, the Law School Students Union um, so, sold its annual hoodies only through Facebook. And I wrote them saying, this is very bad. Um, and they said, yeah, sorry, but didn't change anything at all. Um, with organisations, at the moment, that's, that, that's one of the biggest areas. Organisations 
basically use Facebook to do everything. They effectively um, subcontract their organization to Facebook. And it's really attractive because it's free and they built the infrastructure for you very, very nicely. So I think as far as organizations are concerned, if you can find other ways to do it, that's great. But actually what you need is an infrastructural change within Facebook. Yeah, and, and that's something that, again, I think only regulation can deal with because they're not going to change unless, they, unless they're forced to. That's what I, I wanted to say. Um, can you conceive of a good Facebook or good Google? Mark, the only thing I could possibly think of is something that you actually pay for so that they don't have to sell your information in order to stay... Um, yeah. It's a, very, it's a very interesting question. There have been various attempts by... Um, NGOs and digital rights organizations to promote or push ethically sound things. And there's one called Diaspora, which I, I don't know if anyone's aware of. I doubt it, because even though it was very beautiful, nobody was on it. And the main reason people are on Facebook is that other people are on Facebook. While the, the community is on Facebook, that's where you've got to be. And people like me can be high profile. I'm not on Facebook. Yeah, but I, I can get away with it. Uh, also, I'm a bit of a geek. I know I have all these kinds of other tools. I do not expect everyone else to spend their time and effort working out how to do things other than on, on Facebook. At the moment, I can conceive of a less bad Facebook rather than a positive Facebook. Uh, what I think we should be doing is looking for a kind of distributed solution where you do one kind of activity on one system and another kind of activity on another system. And the young people, in my experience, are starting to do that. And that's one of the reasons Facebook bought WhatsApp, because they found that the young people are using WhatsApp to do the stuff that they wanted them to do on Facebook. And they said when they bought WhatsApp, we're not going to share data from WhatsApp with Facebook. And then about a year later, they said, oh, we've start, just, just started sharing data from WhatsApp on, on Facebook. Um, but if you can find different tools to do different things rather than doing them all in one way, I think that's the only positive thing. I am not optimistic in this area. I think I've been trying to get people off Facebook for years. I don't think they're going to do it. I think I've been, yeah, hoping for something that's never going to happen. Well, the, 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 the data protection law um, says that you can't take data outside the European economic area unless you have um, a, what we call a adequacy. You have equivalent protection in, in another country. Now, we've had a big problem with this because um, there was an agreement with the US called the Safe Harbor Agreement, which meant they could transfer it to US, and that was invalidated because of a case, a wonderful case, um, which w was taken um, against Facebook, effectively, for shifting that data where it could be uh, read by any of the American authorities. Um, within the European Economic Area, um, we currently are allowed to transfer data wherever we want. After Brexit, who knows, because frankly, the government is in a... <laughs> Well, they're in do total denial about the implications for data protection of Brexit, even though they've put a new data protection bill in the, in the, in the, on the, the cards. Um, what you can do, and what data protection law does allow, is potentially huge fines for not providing sufficient security. Because one of the principles of data protection law is that you have to look after the data. And the new data protection law that comes in in um, April 2018 brings in massive fines. The thing is, will they actually use that ability to find companies? If they do, then that's probably the only way. The only way to punish companies is to hit them in the bank balance in, in the end. And, or, even better, jail their um, chief executives. But um, that, I'm afraid, is, is um, far too political a thing for, for any uh, current flavour of government to consider, though that would be something I would like. It's interesting, I've just, just been writing about the Pirate Bay. They jailed the people who ran the Pirate Bay, holding them responsible for what they, what they did. 
but they don't, that was in Sweden, but they don't jail um, corporations who deal with our data incredibly badly. I, I would like to think so. Well, you said that you sort of turned around what I thought things were, so you tilted it around, but I thought WhatsApp would be quite a good place to do an encryption, but as you said before, content is actually probably not the yeah, thing um, you're worried about. I, I, I mean, it, it's, I, I, would st I would still prefer WhatsApp to Facebook, and I'm not on WhatsApp or Facebook, but my daughter is on WhatsApp, because as a, an 11-year-old, that's how, if, I don't know if anyone's got children of that age, that seems to be the way that 11-year-olds communicate well, these days. On Facebook, you're not allowed to be on Facebook until you're, if you're, uh, okay. if you're under 13. 13 is the official age. WhatsApp is lesser evil than Facebook. Yes, WhatsApp is definitely lesser evil than, than, than Facebook. Um, and for, for, for numbers of reasons. They don't profile the users in the same, the same kind of way. And because content is encrypted, that is one level of protection. When I said that metadata is more useful than content, it doesn't mean that they can't do hideous things with the content as well. <laughs> they can. It's the illusion that the content is, it matters more than the, than the, the metadata that's the, that's the key. Yes. <laughs> They've got a great profile of you. Um, I'll make it even more depressing. Okay. I left Facebook. I was on Facebook very briefly, and I left it as soon as it became possible to leave it. Because in the initial stages, it wasn't possible to leave it. It was only after action from the um, from, from the European Union. Any Brexiters amongst you? The European Union is the only thing that has protected our privacy over the last um, 15 years, at least. Um, after action by the European Union, they allowed you to delete your profile, so I did. Um, but there's a website called ProfileEngine.com that archives old Facebook profiles. My Facebook profile from all those years ago still exists on ProfileEngine.com. I emailed ProfileEngine.com and said, please delete my thing. They said, certainly, sir. Just send us a, f a scan of your passport driving license and... <laughs> I left it. I left it on there. I decided the, the risk was lower. I wasn't going to send them uh, all that precise precise detail. There is a state, there is a way in which it's all too late anyway, but I think we can't just give up on, on that basis. I mean, one of, the, one of the, 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 the regular arguments is that privacy is dead. Get over it. The, 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 an American um, CEO of Sun Microsystems said, you got zero, to, to journalists, you've got zero privacy anyway, get over it. That was in 1999. And since then, we've lost so much more privacy. It's a, it's a funny thing. But my my answer to that is, if we've got, if, if privacy is dead, I want to resurrect it. And I think we can do more to change things than we think. And that's when I get back right to the title of this, a changing world. I like to think that we could actually change almost any of this, because the only thing that is certain is that things will change. They'll probably change in a horribly worse way, but it's possible to get them to change into a in, in a better way. Uh, that doesn't really help you very much, I'm afraid. That, that sounds like a confusing statement. Yes. <laughs> it has a burning question that they would like to put. Thank you very much indeed, Paul, for an absolutely fascinating and gripping and revealing and thought-provoking and slightly disturbing, but very helpful <laughs> talk. I'm particularly disturbed by the smart kettles and also by my creeping sympathy for Grant Shafts. Um, but um, thank you very yes, much. Yes, I... I, 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 I